Good morning and welcome to the Place Tech Talks Residential. My name is Dan Hughes, founder of Alpha Property Insight, which helps property companies to navigate digital transformation. I'm also involved in the Real Estate Data Foundation, which is a not-for-profit initiative aiming to help the sector with the large-scale uh, data problems that we face, and in particular, raising data ethics up the agenda. In a minute, we'll be kicking off with the first panel session exploring the changing landscape of the residential market. And then after a short networking break, we'll have the second panel, which is going to focus a little bit more on the technology and how it can support these changes. There'll be more time at the end for networking as well, so please do get involved as we go. Network and ask questions during the panel sessions. I'll do my best to introduce any questions into the discussion. The networking room, which is hopefully where you've already experienced, is where you can join tables and video chat with other guests. You can move between the tables by double clicking on the table you want to go to and you can meet different people. There's also private messaging in the chat function if you want to swap numbers, follow up meetings. And you can also search for guests by name in the chat box. You can also click on sponsors logos on the right hand side to find out more about them. And that leads me on nicely to thanking our sponsors for today. Bruntwood Works, Malcolm, and Morgan Sindel Construction. The residential property is an amazing and fast changing place to be at the moment. At one end of the scale, house prices and transaction volumes continue to grow, but at the end, other end of the scale, we're only building around half of the targeted new homes each year. Affordability is getting worse and homelessness is growing. Add into the mix the last 12 months, where the fact that some people have found that they can work just as well from home, if not better than in the office, Whilst for other people, the opening of offices can't come soon enough. Where the residential market goes may be uncertain, but what is for sure is that technology has a major part to play in enabling us and the sector to move forward. And talk of technology in the sector seems to be everywhere. So whether it's land registry exploring blockchain, new ways to invest and transact property, the sector's coming together around the adoption of the unique property reference number or UPRN, new data sets becoming available, or the focus on data and digital in the planning consultation. Technology seems to be everywhere and it will certainly have a major part to play. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So I'm really looking forward to uh, introducing the first panel. Just as a final reminder before I do that, please do put in your questions and I'll do my best to answer those and introduce those into the conversation as we go. So Tal, perhaps I could start with you. Good morning. Could you just introduce yourself, say a bit about your organization and your view on the residential market? Yes, of course. Um, my name is Tal. I'm the brand and marketing director at Vonder. For those of you who don't know, Vonder is a global and co-living lifestyle brand. We offer young professionals um, beautifully designed homes with a sense of community. That the basic idea behind it is to allow them to move freely between cities without all the hassles and the struggles that you normally have when you're moving to a new home and to a new place. Um, we currently operate in London, Berlin and Warsaw with Dubai, the US and Dublin coming very soon. Um, it's very nice to be here and uh, yeah, I'm very looking forward to here um, and to basically discuss all the different topics. Brilliant, thank you very much, Tal. And Joe, perhaps I could come to you next. Could you say a bit about yourself and uh, and your role? I'm Joe Winchester. I am an executive director at CBRE in our valuation department. Specialise in the field of purpose-built student accommodation and co-living across Europe. Um, very excited to be here today and about um, the latest trends um, in in the bed sectors and emerging markets and how technology. Um, is fitting into those trends. Fantastic, thanks Joe. Honor, good morning. Same question to you. Morning, Dan. Uh, my name's Honor. I'm Managing Director of Birch Cove, which is uh, a bunch of old people in this building uh, experiencing assisted living for rent. And the reason, so we're the first ones to do rent, but actually hopefully the rest of the industry is piling in now um, because our sort of fundamental belief was that to buy a home in your 80s is such a massive barrier to entry. It's such a huge uh, transaction that people get put off and then they stay in their hugely under-occupied four-bedroom semi-detached homes. So we have a community here in Sidcup, uh, one in Woking, and then three more opening in Surrey. And uh, 
I'm experiencing extreme imposter syndrome here, Dan, because I've ended up on a technology panel and I'm the last person who should be on a tech panel. <laughs> Uh, it's the most important perspective, so absolutely not a, not at all. So thank you very much, Anna. And Anthony, good morning. Last but not least to you, uh, maybe you could just introduce yourself and your organisation. Uh, good morning, Dan. Um, so my name is Anthony Breach. I'm a senior analyst at Centre for Cities, where I'm also the lead on uh, housing and planning uh, and all the work that we do, which is you know, producing research on um, Britain's uh, cities and providing policy recommendations on how to improve them. And, and we think that cities are uh, very important, maybe we're biased in, in that respect, um, but um, you know, our kind of overall, overarching analysis of kind of the residential sector is that the way the planning system is designed, that it's uh, discretionary and case-by-case -case decision making uh, creates bottlenecks and a systemic shortage of housing. So we're particularly interested in some of the planning reforms that are going on at the moment and um, some of the digital elements around those. Okay, brilliant. So, Anthony, if I could stick with you for a minute, I'd love to come back to some of those planning points because I think they're really important. But to start off with, in the introduction, um, this was changed. It's, it's unavoidable to talk about the impact of COVID. And on here, we've obviously got a diverse range of different types of beds or residential providers. So, could you just touch on how you think that uh, the residential market has changed in the last five years or so, but in particular, the last 12 months? And yeah. from your point of view, the impact on cities? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, I mean, we've all experienced in the past year, like a lot of disruption um, and, you know, the economy in the residential sector is no exception to that. Um, but, and there's been, we've all kind of experienced the changes around working from home and sort of seeing how that's affected commuting patterns, etc. cetera. Um, but from our perspective, sort of, if you glean through the data and, and you look at sort of the underlying trends, I think you can see some quite counterintuitive patterns or certainly ones that are um, kind of the opposite of, kind of the conventional narrative that, everyone is fleeing the city and everyone is moving out to the countryside and we'll all be able to work from home um, from now on. And I think some of the best data we've seen on this is um, uh, looking at um, Airbnbs and kind of how they've kind of held up over the course of the pandemic. So if you compare Airbnbs to hotels, um, hotels have seen massive declines in occupancy and, um, and uh, kind of vacancy, uh, increases in vacancy rates over the course of the pandemic. And that's obviously because international travel is much more limited. But Airbnb hasn't experienced quite the same pattern. If anything, we've seen that Airbnbs in the countryside have done much better than um, you know, hotels have in the cities and certainly city centre Airbnbs. And what seems to be happening is that people who are um, in house shares or kind of who are living in the city at the moment, who during lockdown, who because of these kind of restrictions uh, on people's movements and their ability to enjoy city amenities, are moving out of the countryside and um, uh, for reasons we'll get onto them in a moment, but they don't want to commit to the countryside, right? So they're moving out to an Airbnb and entering into like a one month kind of rolling contract month by month um, so that they can stay out of the city, but then also when conditions improve and when restrictions are, are removed, they can move back to the city eventually when, when they want to. And that may not be London necessarily, it may not be Brighton, maybe they move out of London to the countryside and into Manchester. We'll see how this turns out in the next um, kind of six months or, or a year or so, but it does suggest to me that I think kind of the fundamental appeal of cities is unchanged, and um, I think people who are predicting um, a um, sort of decline in the city uh, as a result of COVID are, are, are making a mistake. And kind of one last point, um, it really particularly seems to be that if you look at um, rental, kind of rents for properties within London, um, that larger properties, properties with more bedrooms, have fallen much more sharply in their prices relative to um, three beds, which are then uh, see bigger drops relative to two beds, whereas one bed has not really seen the same disruption that we've seen in other parts of the market. And what that says to me is that people are really, really desperate to get out of house shares. Right? That we have this dominant form of uh, typology among uh, younger people, among professionals, that they're expected to move into kind of moldy old Edwardian piles, and then um, you know stay in a kind of room and then share a kitchen or share a bathroom. And that's been particularly difficult for a lot of people over the course of lockdown, and over the course of restrictions. So I think over the future of kind of the, the residential market, looking, you know, three to four, five years from now, I think co-living, I think is um, where you have a more kind of professionalized sector and maybe kind of more privacy in the current model, but also smaller one beds uh, and more kind of one bed apartments are sort of the, the missing piece of the puzzle in our kind of urban residential market. So that, that's where I'd like to see uh, policy uh, and the market respond over the next five years. 
Okay, that's really, really interesting and, and lots of good points there. So, Joe, maybe I could come to you. So, so you look after both co-living, which Anthony just mentioned there, and, and student accommodation. How have you seen that change over the last few years? And, and in particular, how's COVID impacted it? And also pick you up on Anthony's points there about the shift from sort of large buildings where people share to a slightly more professional approach. Okay, so um, over the last um, five years, obviously, the market is maturing in the UK, although most university cities do still have headroom because um, a lot of accommodation has been built over the last 20 years. But although it's seen rapid growth, it started from an extremely low base of modern accommodation. And in fact, we're now seeing the market come round again and opportunities being you know, existing stock being revamped or, you know, still further new development in better locations. Um, I think the co-living market is an interesting one because really it began, it's only really begun at all in the last five years. And there is still um, only a very small number of up and built co-living schemes, but there is a lot of interest in development. And um, as Anthony has pointed out quite eloquently, Anthony's completely right in that there is a gap in the market for um, single person households and having well-designed products that really caters to their needs. And I completely agree that this pandemic situation, um, I think although a year ago, there was a lot of questions being asked about the co-living model, I actually think that a year on, people have realised that exactly as Anthony says, the people are a bit over house shares. There is a need to self-isolate and socially distance. Um, people do want professionally managed accommodation. They don't necessarily want to have to deal with um, not particularly well organised private landlords. Um, and they want accommodation that is specifically designed for their needs. So they may uh, you know, and the concept behind co-living is a small private unit, but with the use of large communal spaces, which encourage both the well-being and social aspect um, and are more suited to the needs of that cohort. And um, I think that it's an interesting growth sector and I, I expect that we will see more of it, but the planning side of it is massively challenging and um, very hit only a small number of examples of sort of successful applications so far. Um, but I think that will get easier as the model evolves. That's great. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, Tal, maybe I could come to you next. Uh, it's probably good news for you that uh, there appears to be a market for co-living, but maybe maybe you can just talk about how you've seen that change over the last few years, in particular yeah, the last couple Yeah, months. definitely. First of all, um, I would like to emphasise that not all the co-living operators are offering um, small units. We, for example, we offer spacious apartments which are fully independent and, um, and self-contained. Um, I think that if COVID has taught us anything is that people need communities. I mean, yes, the living space is a very, very important um, um, part of every person's life. However, we felt that during the last year, people are looking for the social experience of housing and not just, um, um, you know, like the space itself. Um, especially after the lockdowns and self-isolations where um, um, people are looking for much more than, okay, just meeting the neighbor in the lobby, but they can use the shared communal spaces to interact, to communicate, and can, they can do it in a much safer way than um, in public spaces. Um, I do agree that, well, obviously, co-living, we, we really design and, and um, make sure that the place is tailor-made for the needs of our tenants, our community members, whether it's uh, working uh, stations, high-speed internet, um, and all the um, things that they need in order to really focus on their craft and um, avoid all the hassles that you normally have. And we do see a high demand for our product. Um, I think that now more than ever before, people are looking for a safe and flexible um, housing experience. Um, yeah, well, we can kind of summarize it that people live where they work and they work where they live. And you really see that, that um, I think that also according to recent 
um, reports, you see that people are um, they're really willing to spend more on housing um, in order to really provide them the best or the most comfortable experience that they can have um, for their different needs, whether it's living, working, or course, everything in the same space. So yeah, that, that's great. Uh, so again, some some great points there. I want to come back to both uh, community and also the way that it's changed working from home or not. But before I do that, Anna, maybe I could come to you. We've we've spoken a bit here about the co living in the the city centre, but what about the the uh, the older generation? What are they looking for, and what what have you seen happen over the last few years? Um, over the last uh, year, um. We've seen quite a lot of crisis. Uh, so we've seen people, you know, making contact on Sunday and moving in on Thursday, like really insane levels of need to to move so that they're not isolating on their own. Um, I guess what, what I don't. I guess for me, I'm still actually unsure about whether this crisis and this sort of post-traumatic stress is going to be ongoing. Or this time next year, we've all actually just fallen back to our usual business models because it has really fundamentally changed how I run this building. It's really incredibly different. The PL looks totally different how we run this building. I mean, it actually looks better because the occupancy is fantastic because people are just not prevaricating, they're, they're making the move. So that's it's really interesting. Um, and, and so, how, how does that change in terms of how you're running it? I mean, presumably, there's a lot of uh, uh, sanitizing sort of stuff but more generally how are you running the building differently yeah there's lots of that sort of stuff it's probably um so we have now two members of staff who we call surrogate daughters and because we've been so isolated from our families there are still you still need your daughter to do things for you you still need her to advocate at your gp to get something for you or to take you for your hearing aid to be tested and the daughters haven't been able to come in so we've had to be the daughters and and fight on the behalf of our residents in the way that your child normally would. So there's two members of staff who did not exist this time last year, and they're now the most busy, in demand, exhausted young women trying to fill that role. That, so that's really interesting. I suppose on the subject of exhaustion as well, uh, I probably care a lot more about the mental health of my staff because of what we've been through. It is a little bit like we've been in the trenches together and so there's now quite a lot more time that I spend looking at them thinking shit you're about to fall apart you know I need to keep you together in the way that this time last year I'm just flogging them you know just work it's really different now it's funny and I just don't know how long it's going to last I don't know when I'm going to come out of this post-traumatic feeling Excellent. So, so you mentioned a couple of things there one of which is the sort of community surrogate daughters which I think is a, an amazing idea from a technology point of view, how do you use technology to create that community, support the people within your homes? Because I know, I, I, I think I'm right in saying that you have quite independent, but also a community aspect to it. Yeah. How do you go in technology uh, in that space? So this is the good thing about the pandemic, isn't it? I mean, it's forced us to adopt all this amazing tech that would have taken us years to get sorted now. So I now have an app. Uh, life loop which we adopted in September because we just couldn't communicate with all the families like when we first went into lockdown we had to call all the children and say we're about to lock down mum and dad because now we have this amazing app which tells me exactly what's going on today I can tell you that Angela yesterday she went to seated aerobics I took a picture of her in the choir tomorrow she's going to film night I mean it's insane like what I now know about them um, and I probably would still be using pieces of paper and post-it notes if the pandemic hadn't forced this piece of technology to just massively evolve. We have a sort of sales management system called Sherpa that if I hadn't had, I think I would have had to furlough all my sales team because I wouldn't have actually known how to make it work. But with Sherpa, it was like everything went into supercharged sales because the tech was just so brilliant. It was perfectly designed for this crisis moment. Um, we have... So we all moved in on site in these buildings and to keep the building legal, you'd have to like flush the loos in all the empty units every Monday. 
And so we now have a piece of tech that tells us, have you done your Legionnaire's tech? Have you done your fire alarm test? Have you flushed the loos? In a way that formerly the handyman used to write it all down and now it's a piece of tech saying to you, Shit, go flush the loos. So I love that piece, that's amazing. And the piece of tech that I'm really struggling with at the moment, which is actually probably why I agreed to come on the tech panel, was to meet people like Ty about, I have a crappy piece of tech. Look at this, look at this. Um, this is like a mock iPad and a pendant, which I'm supposed to wear around my neck, which, which actually all my old women shove it in their bras because it's so unattractive. You know, you've got to have it on you. But, and I'm just really hopeful that this crisis that we've had has forced loads of people like Ty in Tel Aviv to just develop the most amazing future proof. That's what I'm looking for. So, so on a Oh, no. so, so can you just explain what the purpose of that is? Not so much necessarily um, where it's kept. I'm, I'm sure everyone has their own <laughs> views on that. But but what, what's that for? How, how do the tenants and residents use that? <laughs> My residents, if you fall anywhere within the perimeter of this building, you press the button. It's two-way speech. You say, I'm on the floor in my bathroom, and within a couple of minutes, we're with you. Um, that's the fundamental piece that's going to keep you alive. Probably the top 5% of our residents do, do need the fall. So you need this thing to set off an alarm as it changes position, just like your Apple Watch does. But I can't find the Apple Watch for older people. And I just need a button. So the Apple Watch has the amazing, if I press it down, it's SOS, it calls the police, it gives them my GPS and it comes. But the Apple Watch needs to be charged every night. And getting an old person to charge this watch every night is really tough. And it's a, you know, it's a 300 quid watch. I don't know how much it costs, but I need a 25 quid watch that yeah. will last for two years, but you can speak on it. Well, with any luck, there'll be someone who's listening who can offer a, a suggestion to that. Um, I'm here. But I also want to just pick up on something else you said, if I can stick with you before coming to, uh, to, to tell, which is, um, you said, I think, something like it's unbelievable how much you now know about your residents, which is clearly good. There's obviously the, uh, the the demonstration that you just used there about knowing when people are in distress. And actually, one of the solutions that I know has been looked at is things like image recognition. So you can see where people are when they've fallen over and you can actually automate that type of thing. Mm. But that also comes with it some really big ethical challenges. So I just wanted to see if you had any views on how do you engage with your residents to, to let them know what you're doing. So the balance between helping them and providing a good service and not being too intrusive works. It's really interesting that, isn't it? Because just because we're all over 65 doesn't mean we're a sort of homogenous bunch of people who all think the same thing. You know, they're wildly different characters. And some of them are feel incredibly supported by the fact that, I tell you what's the most emotive one is your DNR, your do not resuscitate. And the fact that at a finger to it, I can tell whether Angela has a DNR in place. Angela finds really reassuring because she doesn't want to be resuscitated. So she doesn't want me to make that mistake. Um, it is a, it's a tricky fine line and you, ha and it's, do you know what, Dan, I don't know how it's going to work. Cause here I know every single resident by name. I know everybody by name and I know their likes and dislikes and I can react to that. When I've got a thousand residents, I can't do that. And then this instrument needs to become a bit more blunt and a little less bespoke. And, and the fact that I do have a photograph every single time they go to the gym, which tells me, great, they're moving, they've done their thousand steps, their heart rate is good. Some of them presumably will start to opt out because they won't trust me with that data. I haven't got to that point yet. They trust me, but you're right, Dan. I've got to, I've got to work it out. And at the moment, I don't have a great solution for that. I know too much. <laughs> but Tal, maybe I could come back to you. So obviously a very different demographic of, of person that you're typically using um, and working with, but, but probably the same challenges. So you're collecting lots of data, you're using technology to build a community, but you've then got the ethical. So maybe just talk about that a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so, so when I think about technology in the residential sector, I, I would divide it to three different topics. The first one is the property management system. So the core, the heart of the business, that's how you basically manage or monitor supply, being able to control and deal with maintenance um, topics, lessons and integration to different housing platforms. Um, I think that the key um, subject is basically automation of processes. It reduces costs, resources, and it allows basically um, um, 
well, to, to, well, it allowed the business to grow and success. And also, um, well, it basically gives you the option to provide a better product to the consumers, but also for, for example, in our case, our landlords with digital dashboards, uh, which allow them to have a full, full control and transparency over their properties. Um, the second one is, as um, Honor mentioned before, it's basically the app. We, for example, um, are going to launch our app by the end of the month. Um, the app is, first of all, a social or communication platform. So it allows people to connect, to network, interact with each other in a safe digital way. And we're talking about um, the leisure aspect of housing again. So it's events, participations, whether it's fitness, music concerts, wellness, like yoga or meditation, some, the, those things also um, help our tenants, our members to um, maintain their physical and mental um, health. Um, and the ease of use, so booking amenities, order cleaning, all the smart home features like smart locks and opening doors. Um, I think that is just generally remove the friction that you normally have um, when you think about housing or, or living um, and provide a one-stop shop, everything in one place. And of course, everything according to the GDPR compliance regulations. So um, that's the second thing. And the third topic from my point of view is the NPS or the net promoter score, the customer satisfaction also like technology, which really helps you by the end to um, get feedback from your, from your tenant and, um, and improve your service and product. Okay, brilliant. That's a really good uh, summary and three ways of looking at it. So, so that's great. Joe, maybe I could come to you as following on from that. So obviously we're talking about lots of data being collected and how technology can use that. I think it comes into the sort of governance. How do you manage that data? And I wanted to try and expand it to the sort of ESG or uh, environment, social and governance um, perspective. What, what are your views on that about how technology is being used, but probably more importantly, how it can help with the ESG agenda? Um, yeah, that is, well, it's a very interesting interface. I think that, generally speaking, the bed sectors, um, by which I mean student accommodation, bill to rent, and co-living, and retirement living, are, to a large extent, at the forefront of ESG property development and investing. Um, the reason I say the forefront is because a lot of mainstream sectors like the office sector, retail, and even industrial um, are still talking about obsolescence and whether their buildings will become unlettable because of energy efficiency and EPC certificates being at the wrong grade. Um, bed sectors offer the opportunity to um, build new products. And because it's being newly built, it can be built to modern standards which then place it at the forefront of ESG. And all investors are interested in ESG and all planning authorities are also interested in sustainability. It's, a, it's not just a buzzword, it's gone way beyond a buzzword. It's now central to most stakeholders' strategy. And I think this is because of the G7 summit coming up, another major climate um, conference being hosted in the autumn in the UK and it's just hugely on the agenda and the pandemic has only accelerated that. So in the general context of ESG by which I mean environmental, social and governance factors, um, I think that where technology fits into that um, and further puts bed sectors at the cutting edge is about so a good example of environmental would be energy efficiency, for example. So technology can be used within a residential block um, to monitor and control the use of energy according to when people are actually in their room. There can be sensors fitted, for example, so that when you leave the room, um, energy is no longer being used. Um, that would be one example. Um, in the social arena. Um, I do know of one operator who um, had an app that actually tracked people's movements. They knew exactly where they bought their coffee, um, where they went out for drinks in the evening and, you know, their movement. And it was also used 
back the usage of communal spaces within the building and that actually helped them to refine their designs for the next building so they knew which spaces the residents actually liked and used which I, I think that was good so it's used to further enhance the product the next time they build a building that data gets built in I'm not an operator so quite how that works with GDPR I'm not actually sure <laughs> presumably they have to opt in <laughs> um, but I suppose those are some good examples and I think other speakers I won't steal other speakers but others are talking about sort of contactless locking systems um, that are very appropriate in this pandemic environment um, and you know another I I was talking last week to an operator um, that was running some really quite small schemes like one scheme of only 60 beds and one scheme of a couple of hundred beds and they developed their own app as on a exactly as Honor says as a way of communicating efficiently with a large group of people so in the case of co-living it enables residents to keep in touch with one another and for the um, and for the operator to communicate, you know, when there's going to be maintenance operat operatives on site or, you know, to communicate with them about an event that's happening or whatever. So I think that, you know, that's just a much more effective way of communicating with large groups of people. Um, and that has really come into its own as well. So, um, that's great. you know, there's some examples that spring to mind of how technology is feeding into the ESG and enhancing the ESG agenda. That's brilliant, thanks Joe. So Anthony, if I could come to you and take a slightly different approach now. So uh, you mentioned earlier planning, um, I think Joe mentioned planning as well. I just wanted to have a conversation about the, the role that planning plays and how it needs to change, what needs to happen moving forward and get your views on that. Yeah, sure thing. So. Um... Uh, I'm sure everyone uh, uh, in the event here knows that there's a housing crisis, that we, we don't build enough houses, and it's, it's why houses in this country, uh, particularly in the most uh, kind of high demand and prosperous cities, are so expensive and so unaffordable, and it's causing economic damage and inequality in, in the country. Um, but I think it, it's sort of helped, I think, to sometimes compare it to other countries, and certainly when you do that, it becomes clear that we have an unusually bad housing crisis compared to uh, many other places, maybe Ireland or San Francisco, or perhaps New York, uh, sort of come close elsewhere in the world. And the reason this is appears to be because we have an unusually dysfunctional planning system that with a system where you can propose something that is policy compliant and it can still be denied planning permission, either at kind of the officer stage or subsequently at the committee stage. So there's lots of this kind of uncertain um, kind of uh, decision making um, and lots of kind of rationing of developments kind of case by case individually um, by uh, planning authorities and most countries in the world do not do that like most countries have a system where if you propose something that complies with the rules you legally must be granted planning permission in most cases and that's really unusual here now um this problem is understood by central government and it's why the government is um pursuing the uh, reforms in the planning white paper and sort of the overarching thrust of everything they suggest and that is a removal of these kind of or, or reduction of these uh, kind of case-by-case -case, um, discretionary mechanisms and how we uh, hand out planning permissions and much more um, certainty and much more kind of rules-based uh, system, uh, which is still nevertheless flexible, but lacks that kind of uncertain um, element. But um, there is kind of a digital element here that there is kind of a tech angle in that um, one of the things they're proposing is to move a much more kind of local plan making process away from like a random list of policies, which um, developments must checklist um, and which all contradict each other and don't make much sense um, towards a much more kind of uh, visual and kind of map based approach to planning where um, you know what if you are proposing a development on a particular site um, the local plan process will be uh, much more uh, digital so that when kind of the consultation process um, when you're looking to kind of acquire a site you can go on to the council's website and you can see well, OK, this is a growth area, so we know that we have much more freedom to um, propose something which is in line with what we know people in this area want. Or this is a renewal area, so we know that this, you know, there are certain limitations around design codes, but we have still have some freedom 
and this is a protected area, so we know that there's actually still quite a lot of discretionary decision making in this in this part. And a system where kind of the consultation process is focused around the creation of maps like that. People can log on to a platform run by their council and see, oh, this neighborhood's going to be in this particular type of um, area. This other neighborhood's going to have this kind of uh, design code with this particular in, in this particular renewal area, and essentially smoothing the process out, making it much more predictable and rules-based and much less confrontational, right? So um, the, the overarching idea will be to make it um, uh, less aggravating, um, faster, more predictable, and also ultimately uh, housing more affordable uh, and getting more construction uh, relevant done in the places where we need it. Okay, that's great. And just to put you unfairly on the spot, but this is uh, th those concepts, use of technology and mapping systems and so on, which which I think are fantastic. It's not as though they've only just come about. So, so what is it that's going to be different this time in the in the uh, process and the white papers that will make a change rather than in the past? So, I think you know, back, as I understand it, kind of back in like the two thousands, there was like a big push for digitization of of the planning process. So, I think a lot of local authorities will have very, very clunky um, online maps where like there's millions of different designations and millions of different rules um, all, all set out in their local plan, which developers have to navigate. And, you know, respondents to consultations also have to navigate uh, to have any kind of say on the process. Um, but the, so the real difference is along kind of with some tech improvements, that means that that's a little bit smoother now. Um, the real change is institutional, right? It's in that decision making process where um, because the rules are going to be set by national governments, because policies on development will be set by government as like a referee of the entire process and local government's job will be using that rule book kind of almost like football clubs do and that they have the same rule book but um, they can choose how to implement them um, uh, within their local area. Um, having that kind of wherever you go in the country, um, having exactly kind of the same rules, knowing exactly what you can expect with some variation around uh, design codes within particular areas means that, you know, the bottleneck that currently exists where getting a planning permission is so unpredictable and so risky, that in theory should disappear. Um, if the kind of reforms in the planning white paper um, proceed through Parliament uh, as, as currently written down. That's great, thank you. And Joe, maybe I could just come back to you. I know you mentioned planning earlier, but also more broadly on the sort of supply and demand issues of, uh, of the property sector. Any views on, on that and how the planning system needs to change and, and the role of tech within it? I think that one of the biggest challenges in the residential market is under supply. Um, and people are renting for longer um, for all kinds of this mega trends which contribute towards this trend of people renting for longer. So one which Anthony has already touched on, which is particularly for employment. So, um, and although there may be a partial reversal of that long-term trend because of COVID, I don't think it's going to be a wholesale reversal of that. People in the long run will still want to live and work in cities. Um, secondly, people are getting married and having children later. Thirdly, there's a massive affordability crisis um, in terms of the need to have, you know, and the aftermath of the financial crisis mortgage criteria totally changed and you now need a massive and this of course is not news to anybody you need a massive deposit um, and quite stringent mortgage criteria apply um, in order to buy a property so for all of those reasons people are renting for longer and the needs in the population are changing and there is simply not enough choice so um, I think that the biggest challenges facing the residential market are a lack of product designed for people who want or choose or need to rent. Um, and um, there are other challenges as well, like things like cladding, for example, is actually an emerging nightmare in the, in the market that for existing stock you know, the industry is still formulating its response four years on from Grenfell. Um, but that is now beginning to be crystallised in the form of guidance and what the industry actually needs to do. 
Um, I think in terms of technology, um, I guess it depends how you define technology in a way. Um, I mean, I definitely think that residential development lends itself, for example, to modular construction, which is not technology, but it's definitely an innovation. And it seems to be built much faster. I think in the planning process, um, I agree with Anthony that um, sort of case by case hit and miss um, process by which planning applications are secured with a built in mechanism for people to complain to the extent that objections can mean that it doesn't get built for sometimes, you know, that sometimes leads to a very inefficient use of our land resources in cities. If there was perhaps less opportunity for people to object and stronger rules about, you know, the need to actually use sites sufficiently and perhaps build taller in some locations, um, then, you know, we might overcome that. I don't, I don't know if the other supply, is, I don't necessarily see it directly as a technological issue. Um, but to the extent that planning authorities and the people who write policy can make the guidance clearer and make online in a way that is easy to digest and access and find the bit you want. I mean, if there's any area where technology could be improved, it would be planning websites, which are generally speaking pretty unuser friendly in my experience. You have to dive very deeply into them to find the bit that you actually want that's relevant. Um, that's great. So, so certainly, certainly it, works. It certainly <laughs> works with our websites by the sounds of it. So, if, if there's anything, if there's anything in the technology arena that seems obvious to me, that would be an easy win. Right? <laughs> but I don't necessarily see it directly as a technology issue. But technology could su probably support um, better access to information. Um, and greater clarity, as Anthony said, in what rules apply and how to interpret them. Um, and that would be a welcome development, I think, which could well assist, um, um, could well assist the sort of acceleration of supply, which is very much needed. Great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Honor, can I come to you next? Uh, a slightly different question that's come in from the audience here, which says, do you think we're a little bit behind with the need to be planning for an aging population? There's lots of focus on the younger generation, but is there enough on the older generation? And, and maybe planning comes into that or not, but just your thoughts on that question. Um, I think Anthony should do the planning questions. Uh, my, uh, I've actually only made it through planning once so far. Um, I bought a plot of land unconditionally, 5.2 million quid, went to the planning committee. The chap before me on the committee was asking if he could cut down a tree because it was blocking his driveway. And he admitted that 22 years ago he'd been really lazy and he took his Christmas tree and he threw it out the back door and it took root and it's grown. And the committee said, no, no, we think it looks really nice there. And I just sort of had sweat pouring off my body going, shit. This is no policy. This is just these little old guys saying, I think that tree looks really nice. Which is what Anthony's talking about. Like, it's just terrifying what we go through. Uh, so I'd rather Anthony reorganize the planning um, situation. My, my only contribution is actually most committees are um, attended by old gits who are absolutely in need of assisted living and they tend to welcome me with open arms because they're like shit I'm gonna move in there so C2 gets quite a good a good journey because it's just a whole load of old people okay brilliant so Anthony we won't ask you to solve the planning system in totality today uh, I think we're running out of time otherwise obviously we would but honor if I could come back to you on the question that uh, it came in from Ben Yexley just on are we doing enough about uh, planning for an aging population <laughs> Dan are you saying I didn't answer the question um, yes, you're saying, uh, are we doing enough to plan for a, no, I mean, no, there is so much money in, uh, in 
elderly accommodation waiting to pile in like there's just this weight of money but we can't get through planning quick enough we we could all be building 10 times more than we currently are so i try and get one out of the ground every nine months i could have enough money to get one out of the ground every three months but i just can't achieve it so no we're not interesting okay thank you very much uh, so I'm conscious of time. We've got three or four minutes left. So, Tara, I just wanted to ask a very quick question that occurred earlier about uh, you, you have buildings all over the place. And I'm just wondering if you had any reflections on uh, how, how the role of technology plays in your buildings, whether that's different in different countries or is it is it a fairly consistent approach? Uh, and I'm conscious of time, so I haven't left you much time to answer, so apologies. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting question. I must say that um, we did see that all the trends were kind of consistent everywhere even though of course different countries or different audiences behave differently um in warsaw for example um people are very much excited about co-living because it's a very new concept for them they know co-working because they had like uh, we work in the city already like a few years ago but they kind of like only now we like discovering co-living and we are basically the first co-living operator there so um, everything which is connected, let's say, to Warsaw, it's so fresh. People are so excited, so enthusiastic. Um, they love the idea of having amenities inside their, their building, whether it's the co-working spaces, the conferences room, um, a bar or a cafe or a gym. Um, so over there, it's very fresh and you do see like that people are very like they are very eager to the concept. Um, and of course, to the whole technological aspect of it, whether it's again the app or all the different digital channels that we use. Um, but we, I, do, I do see that it's consistent kind of everywhere. So also, of course, that in London, um, what we offer, all the on-site amenities that we offer, let's say in, in, in the complexes, they cater to the needs of, of our tenants as well. So um, to your question, yes, I do see it consistent um but of course people behave kind of differently in every place it really depends okay brilliant so i think we're pretty close to the end now so what i'm going to do is put uh, all the panelists on the spot and just ask for a 10 second answer if i may about uh, what would you recommend people do to go the one thing to, to get ready for the sector moving forward or what would you like to happen see happen across the sector so we're a little bit more ready for the future of property or, or technology so, Anthony, maybe if I could start with you and, and put you on the spot, what's the one thing that you would say to people to go and do or you'd like to see happen? I mean, if I was to wave a magic wand, I would say that um, get most of the get the planning reforms through, uh, as we set out in our consultation response. Um, but I guess audience listeners, um, I think probably learning, I think, from the example of uh, Tokyo and Japan and sort of how their flexible zoning system works, uh, it's probably the best thing. Uh, to kind of get an idea of what a new system will look like. And I'll post a link to an article I've written exactly on this topic. Perfect. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, Joe, maybe I could come to you next with the same question. Sorry, trouble with the microphone button. Um, so I think that what I'd like to see is developers being more realistic about what co-living products they're bringing forward. So slightly bigger rooms um, and taking the requirements of planning authorities seriously. Equally, then I would like there to be more clarity in the system, particularly around co-living. Um, there needs to be more clarity and consistency as to what, um, what will gain approval. And then we will see the, the sector developing, a much needed sector developing more rapidly. Brilliant, thanks Joe. Uh, Tal, your view on that, one thing you'd like to see. What you'd recommend? I would like to see more BTR and co-living schemes in upcoming neighborhoods. Um, I think that now people want to um, to save costs, um, and and they don't need to live in the in the city center because they don't need to commute every day. And I think that it's also going to continue. So I would definitely like to see more 
um, interesting developments which are outside of the city center and in upcoming neighborhoods. I think it's going to be really nice. That's brilliant, thank you. And Honor, uh, if I could leave the last word to you, I appreciate the first thing that you want to see is a slightly more functional button that people can press to, uh, to alert you to problems. Is there <laughs> anything, else, anything else that you would say? Um, I would say that anybody who's prevaricating somewhat, uh, looking at uh, accommodation for elderly people should pile in stop overthinking about it, stop making PowerPoint presentations for your investors, just honestly get in. There's a ton of demographic, there's loads of money, huge need, it's life-changingly brilliant, it's really fun to work in this industry, so I would just crack on and start building. Brilliant, that's four final thoughts that are all excellent and uh, different, so thank you very much. So I think we're pretty much at the end of the session now, so I'm just gonna say thank you very much to Anthony, Honor, Joe and Tal for joining. Um, we're going to have about 10 minutes or so of networking now, and then we will come back and have the second panel, which will be digging into a bit more of the technology side of things. So thank you very much. and look forward to seeing you in about 10 minutes time. Hello and welcome back. Hope you managed to grab a coffee and do some networking. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us for the second panel discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. So if I could ask everyone to turn on their cameras and mics, uh, then join us at the virtual stage. And just whilst they're doing that, uh, please can I just remind you, please do put in questions into the Q&A section and I will do my best to introduce those as we go through the conversation. So thanks very much for joining us, all of you. What I'd like to do is just start off by asking you to introduce yourself and say a little bit about you, your background and your, your organisation, uh, and then we'll get into the discussion proper. So Gonzalo, perhaps I could start with you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. So I'm Gonzalo, the founder of Rencap, which is a prop tech platform that's helping public sector, local authorities, housing association, and also SMEs to boost their development capacity. So essentially helping their internal teams to be able to do a lot more, bring forward all those sites which are uh, underutilized, forgotten, locked away, and bring them to the market, deliver more homes, and get people the homes that they need. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim, maybe I could come to you next. Good morning. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jim Eaton Terry. I'm CTO at Quintain. We're currently building the UK's biggest build to rent development in Wembley Park. So about 86 acres, which will have just over 6,000 units by 2027. I joined about six months ago. My role is really to try and bring together the various different technology strands that we've put in place as we've been building the estate and turn them into an operational technology bit, technology led business. Fantastic and an amazing time to join a company uh, in yeah. all sorts of good and different ways. Sam, good morning. Maybe I could come to you next. Yeah, hi, good morning everyone. Thanks for the invite to join. So I'm I'm Sam Kemp, the co-founder and chief investment officer at Imo Capital. Um, been in real estate myself for about 15 years now, Cushman's PwC and Blackstone and we set up IMO about four years ago in response to seeing the increasing allocations of capital uh, to the resi sector, but the lack of deployment opportunities. Um, multifamily and built to rent to uh, make up about less than 2% of the resi market was that 98% of the resi market is existing stock. And uh, that's what we set out to, to solve for. So we've essentially created a data-driven investment platform using technology across the whole value chain to enable institutions to aggregate single family resi into rental uh, portfolios for the first time. Okay, amazing. And then we'll come back to the, uh, the existing stock point because I think it's, uh, it's really interesting. Jamie, good morning. Good morning, how are you doing? Very good, thank you very much. Maybe I could just ask you to introduce yourself and your company and a bit about your background. Sure. I'm Jamie Campbell, the co-founder and CEO of Fronted. Um, Fronted is a very simple business. We pay for people's rental deposits for them. Um, you know, part of what we part of what we built our company on in terms of our the um, you know the strategy was that we wanted a product which helped tenants move into properties easier using cash, using the existing systems. Um, you know, and giving landlords cash, uh, putting uh, money into the deposit protection schemes and ultimately, you know, making tenants save up a deposit. So as they kind of repay us back, the deposit that's in the scheme becomes theirs. So they are essentially using fronted like a like a savings account prior to 
Uh, prior to founding Funted, I founded a, another business called Bud in the fintech space. So my, in the fintech space, so my background is financial services and, and technology. Um, that business was based on open banking technology, which I'm sure we'll come on to uh, later on. Um, you know, and that business works with huge international banks like HSBC, Goldman Sachs, and Australia, New Zealand Bank. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to be here, and uh, and and I'm quite excited to share some of the some of the things that we've been doing at Fronted. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, all, uh, and some some really good perspectives I think we'll have on this conversation. I just wanted to reflect on the first panel we had earlier, which was which was really good. And one of the big things that came up there is around supply and demand and the challenges around that from the property point of view. And another theme which is obviously related was planning, not so much the planning process, but actually planning being a, an enabler or, or barrier to that. So I just really wanted to talk about supply and demand, the challenges around planning, and in particular, how you see technology can help with that if we can, as a starting point of view. Maybe Gonzalo, I could come back to you as a starting point there to, to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. And, um, there, there's a humongous problem in the housing sector, which which was there before COVID. Um, we were we needed we have a target of delivering 300,000 homes a year, and we know that from research there's a demand in the UK for 340,000 homes every year. But before COVID, we were only building 180,000 homes, which is just ridiculous. Like what what other industry? Think about it this way: what other industry? has such a massive gap between the demand and supply that constantly doesn't get met. Pretty much housing is like one of the only ones that we're only delivering 60% of the homes that we need to deliver every single year. And um, it's causing obviously huge socioeconomic problems. But other than that, it's just a massive business opportunity. And we've not been delivering for the last 50 years. The market's been broken since the 70s. That's why house prices are ridiculous and the average house price to, sal to kind of average earning at the moment is nine times across the UK, 13 times in London. It's just ridiculous. Um, we're, the, we're here to kind of try and solve that problem. And um, what we've done, from my experience, I used to work uh, Arcadis previously. So um, worked for lots, lots of large residential schemes and decided to dive into prop tech and support um, to kind of solve some of these, house these problems related to delivery including planning. And what I've seen is that's not the only problem. There's loads of problems. So the first one is data, clients, local authorities, housing associations, central government. Sometimes they don't know what land they own. So how can we deliver more homes when you don't, first of all, you don't know what land you own. Secondly, when you identify that land, how do you decide which ones to develop? Which ones should be on the development, on your development plans? And at the moment, there's no data. So we're, we're helping them to do identify sites do the site investigation at a click of a button, which is a very tricky process. Do the feasibility, do the design and planning all through tech because design and planning, um, I wasn't at the previous session, but one of the key barriers is there's a massive amount of underutilized brownfield land in the UK. But if you're going to put resources into doing the design and planning process um, as a local authority or as a housing association, you might as well focus on the larger sites because the design and planning process takes the same time if it's a large site or a small site. So you're gonna focus on the big stuff. The small stuff, design and planning is a huge barrier because why would I put nine months of our time and resources into 20 homes or 40 homes when I could be doing it on 100 or 150? So we're helping through tech to unlock all those sites and inefficiencies to make those sites feasible. Because there's, a, there's I think Dan, I, think, I mentioned it before, there's, there's enough underutilized land in the UK to deliver over 1 million homes that will plug the deficit for six years in a row. And the market right now and the models are not working to unlock that land. So what's going on and why aren't we doing it? And that's that's kind of what we're, we're pushing towards. That's great. So some, some, some great points there about various different things and some great stats as well. I like the, uh, the 1 million home stats. I um, haven't heard that before. But Jim, maybe I could come to you next. Uh, obviously, from your point of view, you are developing this land and uh, just your view on going about the, the finding land, the, the role of technology in the finding land, the planning and the building process. Uh, um, that. I think in terms of finding land, there's a lot of interesting technology around. It's not something that we're focused on very much at Quintain purely because our, we've got enough land to keep us going for the for the moment. But there is a lot that I've looked at before around modeling and understanding what the what the possibilities of land are. Um, in terms of planning, 
it's a really interesting question about how you could use technology. One of the areas I've we've looked at in the past and not in this role but in previous roles is around how we get a better sense of what of how developments will work in the community through using technology because there's always the danger of just landing giant tombstones of development in the middle of a community without understanding what that means and there's a lot of good work happening in that area okay that's great uh, I'd like to come back to that. Community was also a theme from earlier on. But uh, Sam, before we, we do that, maybe I could come to you and look at it from a different perspective, from an investor point of view. So you mentioned, I think it was 98% of the uh, residential market is the individual already built aspect. So obviously you're talking about the, the new build is one side of things. But how are investors' uh, needs and demands changing? And in particular, how can technology help with that? Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. Um, I think... One of the thing, one of the mistakes um, people have sort of historically made is when thinking about how to get in, from an institutional perspective, how can they access the uh, the resi market? They've just been thinking about um, build to rents, and obviously build to rent serves um, a much needed purpose of delivering new stock, as Gonzalo was saying, in a very undersupplied market, and most of Europe is actually facing similar issues to the UK in this regard, but. What is also quite concerning for investors at the moment is the amount of carbon emissions that are being generated from the steel and concrete used in, in construction. I think it's about 10% of the UK's carbon emissions are related to construction, which frankly is not a great stat. And there are many companies out there trying to solve um, to make um, construction more, um, you know, more carbon neutral, but that, that isn't happening fast enough. Um, and, you know, that sort of links to the to the ESG point, which is ESG is becoming, you, you could have a whole separate conference on, on ESG, it's, you know, so I'm definitely not going to do it justice uh, now, but it's become one of the key trends um, within the investment world. Although the word trend is probably quite unfair because ESG as a topic is actually, it's not a trend, it's, it's, it's very much becoming embedded in investment policies and allocation strategies and it's... Um, um, it's been accelerated over the past six months by the introduction introduction of new um, new regulations. But um, so it's, it's it's definitely moving from a box ticking exercise for investors to becoming a really fundamental component um, of their investor decision making. Um, so when we've been speaking um, with investors, they you know so what Imo is doing is aggregating um, existing housing stock that's often been really underinvested in for many years by unprofessional landlords and and we're recycling it to make it fit for purpose for consumers and and another angle is that of that is that we're you know we aren't attempting to draw people away from existing communities into new housing developments but instead offering a better quality housing product to consumers within the communities they already live in so you know and that that in its itself has been very attractive to institutions um so I think, you know there's the esg part and there's the single family resi and single family resi as an asset class is it's been very popular in the us for a number of years now and the same way that multifamily started in the us and then came to europe um we're seeing the same transition with uh, with sfr single family resi at the moment um, you can see that you know we've we've signed uh, we recently signed a 900 million deployment with one of the largest global investment managers in January. Goldman Sachs bought uh, the first SFR portfolio that was brought to market in Europe, and and there's a number of other investors actively looking at this space now. So um, yeah, so I think ESG and, and SFR are two major emerging topics on on investors' agendas that are that just only going to grow, uh, continue uh, gaining in significance. Okay, that's great. Just to stick with the ESG point, uh, I mean, obviously that, as you quite rightly say, is a massive topic that we could talk for days on, but p particularly focusing on the sustainability bit, which is the bit that you mentioned there. How do you go about using data and technology to measure and to communicate that to investors? Or is that something that still needs to be developed further? So was that a question to me, Dan, or was that to someone else? It was to you, Sam, sorry. Yeah, so, so the gathering of the data, that's really, <clears throat> that's really tricky. Um, that's really tough. And obviously, there's a lot of, you know, s smart meters being brought in, and there's other um, you know, other sensors being brought in and things like that. But it's still, it's a very disparate, um, granular, fragmented um, space at the moment. And I think even some of the biggest institutions are, are struggling to figure out how to put a wrapper, 
essentially the wrapper around the whole piece to be able to bring it all together to be able to really um, sort of find, um, you know, useful, genuinely useful insights that, that allow them to make um, sort of concrete decisions. Um, we're speaking with a number of different, um, there's a few different technology players out there. I think, you know, there's, there's one that's um, in the US that Fifth Wall have invested into called Measurable that, um, you know, has been sort of gaining quite a bit of steam and I'm just speaking with them at the moment. But they're, yeah, they're, you know, really trying to tackle that issue of how you go in and, and measure all these different um, elements um, on a granular level bring it all together and sort of generate some real contribution. I don't think anyone has definitely solved that perfectly right now. Um, so it is, it is definitely something that is a challenge for people, but it's coming. It's the, the solutions are, are on their way. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. And Toby, maybe I can come to you and pick up on the point that, that's been picked up there about data sharing. But in particular, uh, maybe pulling on your experiences from, as you mentioned earlier, the open banking side, of so the, the financial services side about exposing and sharing data a little bit more. How have you found that in the property sector? And what do you think we need to do in comparison to lessons learned, for example, in financial services to make that a more open, open platform? Well, great, really great question. Um, you know, we approach things very much from the point of view of uh, how do we make things better for renters and, you know, Kind of following on from something that Sam, uh, that Sam said earlier um, about just the you know the amount of investment going into this into this space, not a lot of that investment is going directly to renters who are experiencing those those issues um, themselves. You know, it, it's kind of going into the infrastructure, going into stock, as everyone is as everyone has been saying. So fronted is kind of a little bit different, I guess. It has a different point of view um, to, uh, to to the to the people in the in the panel in the sense that. You know, we really are trying to build solutions for renters, you know, and the problems that they that they experience. One of those um, issues is the cost of moving. Um, and Fronted, because we're founded by people who have come from the financial services industry, you know, who um, have kind of helped build and establish the system of, of open banking, which was, was kind of was, was actually pioneered in the UK. As a, as a regulated um, and safe way for users to, to share their transactional data. So the data that lies within their, within their bank accounts um, with regulated businesses such as ourselves um, to, you know, to open up new services to them that may not have been available you know, by using traditional methods. Um, in, in the case of Fronted, we use open banking and this kind of data sharing to, um, to unlock the deposit product that we have. So instead of relying on someone's credit score and bearing in mind young people who are renting and moving who, you know, who may find the upfront cost of a deposit plus, you know, your first month's uh, rent in advance um, a challenge and who don't have parents to provide that capital, they also probably don't have a good credit history um, because they're, they're young um, people and they probably haven't built up that, um, you know, that bank of data. So we're able to use this, um, you know, this particular way of sharing data to um, you know, to to find out whether these people are appropriate to to have a product like uh, like the fronted deposit, um, it lowers the bar of entry really for those people to get benefits from businesses like like ours. Uh, but it's one piece of the data puzzle that uh, technology is 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 fixing. Really, you know, what's really interesting for us is how do we broaden that. Um, you know, the access of, of data in a way that is a great customer experience. So I'm not having to use multiple different windows to log in in one place, copy and paste. You know, it is something that's much more technology led using APIs to um, integrate multiple different services, um, you know, into the same um, into the same app or the same website so that for a user, it is a really simple experience. Um, that's kind of what open banking is right now. Uh, and, you know, if you if you use the uh, the fronted product or if you have you know, kids who are uh, who are renting and they're looking to, um, you know, looking to move and don't want to pay that deposit up front. You can see, you know, within the product how easy it is to, um, you know, to, to to kind of onboard using the uh, using using bank data. But there are other very useful bits of information that are um, that are residing in either government-owned or kind of big um, institutions, which would make moving really much easier for for clients, such as you know, previous deposit um, performance, data that resides in deposit protection schemes, you know, which say, well, this person doesn't 
you know, doesn't usually have any money taken out of their deposit. That's really great information for a business like ours and really great and powerful information for a, for a tenant who's looking to move, who wants to prove that they, you know, that they're good uh, and that, um, you know, and you know, rather than have two deposits out at the same time because they're waiting for their, you know, previous deposit to be returned before they put their next deposit down, they can use the evidence that sits in these schemes or in, you know, in their previous track record with other landlords um, you know, to, uh, to, to, to use their existing deposit as collateral to, to move much, much easier and a better value. So, you know, we approach it from, from that point of view, where we want to use um, data and technology services to make the sharing of data much easier in order to have, you know, great customer experiences and great customer outcomes. Um, and I think the financial services industry has done it relatively well, considering that it's big, archaic companies um all sticking to the same standard um but we want to bring that you know further we want to make um you know more of an impact on our on our uh, on our renters in, in the uk to make sure that they're not bottom of the food chain here um and they're actually being provided great services that's great so i want to come back to talk about tenants in a minute because i, I think you've raised some great points there but jim if i could come to you obviously yeah. relatively new into the property sector but you've got some great experience in other sectors as well so Maybe you could just reflect on data sharing within the property sector, but also different sectors move at different paces. So property and construction typically is quite a slow moving sector, but data and technology is quite a fast moving sector. How do we how do we put those two different different speeds together? Well, I mean, it, it, it's different in different parts of the business. So I think the in kind of upfront development and the construction pipeline, actually, I think technology and data has really evolved really evolved very impressively in the last few years and if you look at the way things like BIM have operated if you look at the way as we talked about data in the acquisition pipeline there's a lot of that I think when it comes to operating operating businesses particularly in resi I think there's a lot less maturity particularly in the UK in the marketplace and that and there it is it's lots of closed environments it's lots of systems that don't talk to each other it's lots of incompatible products and that's one of the challenges we're having to figure out how to break down. I think you're still in the position at the moment where you, if you look around the market, you've got some people who have just decided, well, we're just going to buy one of the monoliths and accept that we're locked into that monolith and we can't talk to anyone who isn't. We've got other people who are doing some variation of, well, we'll build the bits we really need ourselves and then kind of figure out how to do the others later. We are starting to look at well can we find a modular partner that lets us integrate but then obviously that carries its own overhead you don't have yet in in resi in the uk and you slightly do in the us the model you can get into in e-commerce or aviation where there are just there are five different vendors for every single module and you can integrate them all in the same way so it becomes a much easier problem so yeah i mean which makes it a fun time to be doing this because you're not just plugging together other people's systems no, absolutely. Uh, Gazala, can I come to you next? Uh, from, from a data sharing point of view, you, you raised that uh, initially, but but probably from local authorities and some of the land that's out there. What, what would you? What are you doing? And what would you like to see happen in this space around data sharing? Yeah. Um, first of all, the, the the data in kind of in construction, in property, and in development. As you mentioned, there's there's lots of different in intricacies. So, for example, in development, data is pretty much non-existent. Um, clients, my clients, a lot of them just don't know what they own, which surprises anyone that I talk to that, to say, yeah, they, they, they sometimes don't know all the land that they own. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to help them to identify that. And then the next stage is figure out which sites are feasible. So for a client, imagine being a local authority where every single pound you spend, someone's looking at it and criticizing you for, for everything. You need to spend money to do development, which is a lot of time at risk. But a lot of time, how are we doing? How are we spending that money, which is at risk, without good, accurate data to help you identify how to mitigate those abortive costs and how to reduce costs that you might spend and might lose? So, for example, even even if you wanted to, a local authority wanted to do a uh, identify if a site is feasible, let's say, to figure out if they can make money on a site and deliver the homes that they need, they need to employ an architect to tell them what the accommodation schedule is, so how many homes they can fit in there. A cost consultant, I'll tell them how much it costs. So benchmark of cost data, which they don't have. A valuer, that'll tell them how much they can sell those homes for, depending on the tenure. So if it's, if it's for rent or if it's for sale or whatever it might be. Um, 
and you're paying all of these people to give you information that you put into your model and then figure out, oh, it's not feasible. So I've just spent 20 grand and we've just lost it because it's not, we're not going to progress on that site. That's a humongous barrier to, to loads of clients. Like why, why do you need to go all the way to have to get all of these consultants to give you the highest level of data? Isn't on ground. There's no way of quickly identifying how many homes you can fit on there and what tenures they could be based on policy, the being policy compliant or getting costs from one data source to say, okay, this is typically how much it should cost. It might dif differ at 50% either way. Um, and this is what typical values should be. They don't get that. They either have to use their own in-house data, which is usually terrible, or go to the other end of the spectrum, which is let's pay loads of consultants and figure out if our, if our site is viable. What we want to do is we're providing that med medium ground using data providers, tapping into partners like Rightmove and others like that to instantly give a client the policy compliant accommodation schedule, the, the comparable cost of what it should cost to build in that place for those homes and the values. So in one click by uploading a site, you'll have all that data. You put it into your model. You figure out, yeah, it's green. Now let's get those consultants on board. And then we have a platform that allows them to connect to those consultants. But that, that's just one example of one of the processes through development, which is just ridiculous and needs to get fixed in order to bring more sites forward. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's great. So Jim, if I could come back to you, it's, it's pretty tricky to have any conversation now without bringing up the impact of COVID and how it's changed things. And you obviously have uh, a number of developments and sites and units that have been constructed over time and going to be in the future. So just wanted to get your thoughts on, on how has COVID changed what you do, the demands of tenants and, and occupiers? Well, I mean, personally, it's meant I've only been to the estate we're running three times since, it, since I've been in the role. So it, it's made that transformation in itself. Um, I think really, I think it comes down to, first of all, for our existing residents, we're having to understand how they're using our infrastructure differently. So if you think about our a three bed apartment is many of them are now not three bed apartments, they're two bed apartments and an office. And when we designed the, the network for the building, they were based on the idea that the third bedroom is probably a child bedroom or a spare bedroom. So we're having to make some changes on that side. We're also looking at how we can build some of our community engagement processes, move them to be more virtual, which is interesting and worth worthwhile and will be worthwhile after, which is one of the big things for us at the moment is what that we've had, we've been forced into accelerating some things we were probably sort of thinking about doing other anyway and understanding, well, having done that, what can we then do as we start to move back into a more or less in-person world? So a good example of that is we introduced a online viewing product halfway uh, early in the pandemic we were lucky in that we had quite very good 3d models of the estate we had very good imagery of all our apartments from other projects we'd done in the past we put them together and turned that into a, a viewing tool that we could use to do a really really good end-to-end -end viewing experience without you having to come to the site we're now looking at well can we now can we still have that but carry it around the estate so that if you see, if you come visit one of our apartments and you like it, but you want something slightly different, we can show you the five other options before you have to spend 25 minutes in the rain in Wembley walking to the various different buildings and just go see the one which looks good. So it's about understanding how you can pivot out of, how we pivot out of the current world and take the benefit of what we, what we have been forced to do. That's great. And Sam, if I could come to you from a, from a person buying property points of view presumably there are different perspectives so picking up on Jim's point there some people will want to go and visit a property several times and some people for different purposes might not have you seen COVID change the appetite of investors to buy without seeing a property or, or at least using more technology to inform that so none of our investors that we work with have seen in person any of the properties that we bought for them even pre-COVID uh, you know so we were we, um, you know, we were doing everything on their behalf. Um, what we have done in COVID, where sometimes the sellers are a little bit more um, unwilling to let us enter their host, their home to do an inspection straight away. We've we've developed. I mean, we had developed already um, inspection apps that our inspectors were were completing when they did the viewings. Being able to get the sellers to complete these inspection uh, apps or 
forms for us and then do sort of virtual viewings for us. so that's worked quite well and then but of course once we've gone under offer on a property so we've been able to gather enough information to make an offer and then once we've gone under an off offer on a property you know we've then sent someone in to actually do a physical inspection that that still can't be avoided um on the letting side uh, really successful similar to what jim was saying we've been you know we've been using matterport to do a lot of um sort of 360 tours and they're incredibly high quality um we've also fully digitized um our our rental process with consumers so whether it's you know the the um the um the leases are all docu-signed um you know all of those things are, have been done digitally anyway even our check-in processes we've been able to do those digitally with um with consumers and those have worked really well um quite interestingly as well by having created a lot of these 360 um, asset tours for tenants we've also been able to reuse them in other parts of the value chains like the valuations piece so it's it's obviously highly inefficient for us to, and we get all of our valuations done red book by um by by cbre actually um so highly inefficient for cbre to be coming multiple times throughout the year to to go and visit you know one property here one property there one property there so you know very inefficient and uh we've actually they've they trust that the quality of these um, virtual tours that we're doing is um you know is high enough that they can still see all the things that they would have seen if they were doing an in-person inspection for red book so from an operational perspective that's also massively helped us both us and them like they don't want to be doing all of those inefficient um inspections either so yeah so we've sort of been realizing that things we've developed in one part of the value chain actually being useful in other parts of the value chain that's really interesting which which makes perfect sense but actually to yeah. see that in practice with a rental platform that can then be used for valuations is is great and just out of interest you, you obviously deal with a number of different tenants or types of tenants do do different tenants uh, or prospective tenants look for different types of technology because obviously different age groups different uh, skill sets and so on um not too much i think the technology isn't i mean it's not that so, I mean, not, it's not that rocket science or sophisticated or complex to get your heads around. It's still very consumer friendly. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a few times when we've had, you know, slightly older people calling us to book an inspection instead of, you know, wanting to book it online. And that's fine. But the majority of people have been able to um, get their heads around. I think especially the past 12 months, just whether it's talking about consumers or investors like across the board, people have been forced to adopt um, in ways that even if they wanted to be resistant before they've really they've not had a choice the past 12 months and that's really opened up so many opportunities everything from consumers being more willing to engage the technology to even investors being more open to the possibilities of what technology can do and we all know real estate as an industry is a bit archaic and dinosaur like and it's it's, it's a, in its willingness to embrace technology. So I think that's also really helped sort of pull a lot of those sorts of psychological hurdles that had been in place with investors. That's great. So Jamie, if I could come to you, we've just uh, heard and, and certainly don't disagree that property isn't always the fastest to adopt technology, but where we do, it's often around the building. Uh, and obviously you're fo focusing a little bit more on the person and the tenants. So I was just wondering if you'd got any thoughts about why that is or where the opportunities were and focusing a little bit more on the person and the tenant that's in there yeah i mean i've talked a little bit about the kind of the the, the data and um and, and things that are, um you know can be made available to to tenants um and i wanted to touch a little bit on on covid i know that we said that we in our pre-call that maybe focusing a lot on covid isn't isn't the right thing to do but um just as it as it relates to tenants um mainly because they were a pretty hard hit bunch. Um, you know, they're the most likely to be in jobs where they've been furloughed. Also, the most likely to be in jobs where they couldn't do it from home. Um, and COVID had a obviously a huge impact on people's behaviour, especially when thinking about, about the home. You know, we talked about home offices um, becoming more important, how green spaces are becoming more important. You know, and I doubt that anyone walking around the last year. Um, you know, hasn't heard hasn't heard the people around them talking about their desire to move, especially if you live in London like I do. Um, you know, it's almost everywhere you go, people are talking about how they um, want to change their their place, and it's not just home buyers and purchasers; it's it's renters as as well. Um, and so, 
you know, we we've obviously we've looked at this from a um, from a point of view of how do we make the um, you know the renter um, a little bit more empowered during this time when they could be coming off the back of quite a lot of, of hardship. And you know, the deposit product that we've built uses cash. You know, it's money, and money is the universal lubricator of the of of the wheels. Um, you know, and we believe that this, you know, really well-priced credit product, which, you know, is arguably the cheapest form of credit that uh, an individual who's in our kind of target demographic will ever be able to get. Um, we believe that not only will that kind of solve the consumer problem of people maybe wanting to act on their desire to move, but maybe not being in the financial position to actually do it. Um, you know, we think that that's a, a, that's a, a great place to, to be, but also, you know, increasing the, um, you know, the velocity in the market, you know, freeing up a bunch of people who, you know, who wouldn't move um, if they didn't have a product like this. You know, that's kind of the, the biggest thing that we're up against is, you know, there's a bunch of people who are sat in apartments, which they're not hugely happy with, but they just, you know, they haven't found a, a low enough bar in order to make them to make them move. Um, you know, and we see a lot of those people coming to us um, saying, oh, well, I wouldn't have moved if this didn't exist. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to do it. And I think the way in which we, you know, we look at our, our product and how technology fits you know, within, within, this, um, within this product in order to how we help tenants is, you know, because we go direct to tenant, you know, we're not selling our product to landlords, for instance. You know, this isn't something that a landlord goes, I want to, I want to get fronted to pay the deposits of all of my tenants. That's not, just not how it works. You know, it goes direct to, to tenant. Um, and because we have that approach, it means that we can do things slightly differently. You know, for instance, we're qualifying these customers from our point of view um, based on the, the new rent that they're going to be paying and the repayments that they're going to be making to us. It makes sense for us in that case to also present people with properties that they're already fronted for, you know, and making that experience of, OK, well, I've, I've, I've come to this, this, this company to, to see if they'll give me a deposit. And more often than not, they're coming to us about 60 days before they need to move, um, which is a really interesting kind of piece of, of, of data in terms of how much value we can offer those, those individuals. Um, so they're coming to us, uh, they're getting the, this, this approval. The approval lasts 45 days. So it kind of gives them plenty of time to shop around. And anecdotally, we've heard people, you know, who are on the borderline of, of you know, deciding on a place, getting a deposit approval from us and actually going, well, hang on a second, I'm going to be a little bit more picky about where I go now because I was kind of, you know, I was, I was kind of taking a, a couple of uh, a couple of hits because it wasn't in the right place or it was, you know, you know, it didn't have the right, you know, setup for me. Now I've got this deposit and maybe I don't have to, um, you know, maybe I don't have to um, you know, settle for a, for a place. Maybe I can be a little bit more, a bit more picky. And that I think is the thing that's really interesting around, um, around how this product is kind of shifting maybe the status quo of how people are looking for properties. Because, um, you know, if we can, if we can get people approved for these deposits, make them feel very empowered when they're looking, um, you know, to, to, to move and also be able to present them with properties that meet all of their criteria that um, you know that they're already kind of approved for a, for a deposit for. Um, we're going to use technology to make this occasion just so much less stress. Um, and then conversely, how do we work with the existing providers that, that are there? Um, you know, this makes a lot of sense when you are right at the point of paying a deposit using you know the existing infrastructure, whether it's a a state agent software, um, you know, or whether it is um, you know a property marketplace. You know, a button that says instead of paying your deposit with, you know, with hard cash that you that you have in your account, why don't you spread it over 12 months using fronted? Um, again, like you coming at it from a technology approach means that that is you know, entirely possible. And the way that we've built the architecture of the product means that it's entirely possible, um, you know, that, that that kind of experience will will exist. And, and, you know, and hopefully that's how people are going to be looking at um you know at, at spreading the cost of their deposits or even bridging their two deposits in the in the, in the future that's great and jim if i just come back to you on uh, on something there about the the usability sam mentioned matterport as an example which has obviously got a lot of traction during this time but uh, away from the specific products a, a question's just come in here about virtual viewings looking impressive to start with but it's not the most attractive service over time how do you go about providing the right services for the, the, the tenants or the prospective tenants 
but making sure that, that it's not just a bit of a, a gimmick, it's actually something that they can really engage with uh, on, on a long-term basis. Well, I mean, things like, things like virtual viewing, by their nature, they're part of the pipeline. So that, but really it's about, under, it's about trying to understand what, what's the baseline services you need to offer in a, in a development and nailing them. So, I mean, the obvious ones, connectivity. There are also ones about how you access our other services, how you, how how you access information about what's happening around these around the building in the estate. All those things tying them together. It's just about the usual, and this isn't special to property, but it's about focusing on what on what users want and trying to go after it and knocking them off one by one. I think there's a I think one of the areas where maybe real estate isn't as far developed as other other sectors is thinking in terms of small incremental product improvements isn't really in place. There's a lot of, possibly because we're used to building giant buildings, there's a lot of, well, it'll take a year and a half and we'll spend a lot of money rather than what can we do in two weeks and get out the door. And even if it's not perfect, the next version will be better, which every every other industry has been doing for at least 20 years, is, is I think how you start to evolve your products in a way that they suit the people who are actually using them. Yeah, Sam, you're nodding away. Do you agree with that? <laughs> yes, very much so. I think, you know, even just taking the example of Matterport, you know, before we introduced Matterport, we were just, we had someone just going around with a video, uh, just videoing it and then putting it up on YouTube. And, um, you know, that was that was our virtual viewing. We didn't need a fancy software and fancy sort of photographic, um, you know, products um, or, or tools. So, yeah, it's, it's I 100% agree with Jim. I think the... Uh, and I hadn't heard that analogy of maybe we struggle because we're used to building massive, big projects. So I quite liked that, uh, that analogy. But yeah, it's, it's completely true. Um, I think, I I think, pardon? <laughs> I said it's the only explanation I've come up with. Yeah, and I think it's also that there's not enough tech and product people in real estate companies. Um, there needs to be more people coming into these big companies with that with a tech first, a data first driven mindset. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges actually that, um, that real estate companies have is that they know tech is coming. They know it's, they need to do something about it, but they genuinely don't understand enough. And it's, and it's frankly, it's not enough having someone like Jim come in as a CTO or having a chief innovation officer. Like it needs more people embedded throughout the organization who are going to be champions um, for insisting that every single decision you make is data driven. Um, and it's not, you know, it shouldn't just be this kind of token thing that's happening over there. So yeah, I think until, until real estate embraces technology and data driven individuals throughout the organization more, I think it's always going to be a challenge. Sam, Sam's right. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, coming from financial services and, you know, large banks, they have, you know, an approach that Sam's kind of touched on there, which is the, you know, a bank's response to challenges coming in, you know, and kind of changing the, the, the game a little bit is, well, let's get a head of innovation, you know, someone with a beard and wears glasses. And I realize how ironic that is me saying that, <laughs> um, you know, and it's, but it's a, it's more of a box ticking exercise than genuinely investing in the skills and capabilities, um, you know, that, that technology driven and data driven individuals have and the and the kind of the the impact that that does have on the way in which you you look and develop things i'm obviously talking from a software perspective because we you know we deal primarily in software and not and not hardware um but i imagine it carries into into those other areas jim you probably got a bit more way more experience than me in, in, in that well i i'm not sure about that but i think i think what i the only the only sort of the only thing i'd challenge is maybe the, the question of bringing people in i actually think one of the things that i found throughout this certainly in this business is that it is not a problem that we don't have people who who un, who understand how to approach these things who have the right ideas it's about putting in place the structure that lets people do it it's about building an environment in which you can actually use those ideas and that's all again that's a problem that businesses have been trying to solve for, for a long time in other sectors and a lot of it's about freeing reducing the cost of an in the re reducing the cost of an experiment so if you if you're always thinking in terms of well we've got to spend a, you know we've got to spend hundred thousand pounds you've got to use some consultants as you do in a building construction you can never do anything unless you know for a fact it's going to work if you can reduce down the cost of an experiment to 
well, I spent a couple of days on it and I spent 300 quid on, on licenses for this and that, and four of them worked, three of them didn't. That's acceptable, but that's not the culture that kind of has been in place in real estate up to this, this point, because I, again, if you apply that to buildings, they tend to fall, out, fall down. So there are good reasons why construction works the way it does. It's just we need to think about the difference between product and building. Yeah, so that's a, so that's a really good point. I think the point you made there, culture, is is a really important one. And real estate is, by its nature, very slow moving. It's very predictable. It's physical and tangible. It's there tomorrow. We don't want to take risks. We don't want them to fall down. And all of those culture aspects are exactly the opposite of what we're talking about here in terms of being data driven, fast moving, test things, fail fast, and so on. So Gonzalo, maybe I could come to you. I, I'm sure you'd agree with a lot of those points, but how do we go about changing that? Because as a sector, we're so big, but we're also incredibly fragmented. How do we go about changing that culture? Yeah, I was, I was just about to jump in on what Jim said, because I, I completely agree. And the, one of the issues we've got with data in the industry is the fragmentation of the property sector, specifically in construction and development. You've got a client, or they, and, and their, their purpose is making sure that, the, that it, it's all viable and making sure they've got the right consultants and the contractor in place. Then the consultants are the experts of their bits. Then the contractor is the expert of his bit. And then the suppliers all do, all, all do his or her bit, bits. And that means that each time we're not really capturing data from those individual parties from the, because it's so fragmented, um, which is one huge barrier. But another thing, which, which is kind of what, what Jim touched on, is... Because things in construction cost so much money and um, you need a lot of information to, to give you the thumbs up to go ahead with it, that means that we, we're not progressing on things soon enough. So what, one of the issues that we've got is we've got this product that basically helps clients do the site investigation on their, on their sites. So every site, you need to understand the risks on the site. So for example, asbestos, utilities, environmentals, legals, ecology, there's loads of surveys you need to get done. Very laborious. With us, we've got a marketplace, client uploads, it goes to our marketplace, it all, it's all automated and super easy. The problem I've got with some clients is they say, yeah, that's, that's amazing. But however, we need to, what, spend 20 grand on surveys and not knowing whether we're going to proceed with that site. And our answer is you spend 20 grand on surveys, but what you receive is data on that site on your portfolio. So you know now which sites are the ones that are... Um, are perfect to do direct delivery on and deliver yourselves. And you also know which sites are too risky and maybe you should sell those to the private sector. Before you didn't know which, which way it would go. Now you know that you can sell those. And if you sell it, you've got a due diligence pack. So it's ready to sell, it's easy to sell. And SME suppliers are just love a, love a site that's already got the due diligence done. So it's, it's change of mindsets. Yeah, it's possible. Paying up front to get that data possibly comes back to Sam's point about Matterport is we traditionally use about use technology or data in one specific silo and then don't necessarily consider using it in other areas but it's a big opportunity there. Uh, Jamie maybe I could come back to you on the culture point so uh, you mentioned financial services is a little bit more data driven open to some of these changes how, how does property and real estate go about changing the culture of the sector to be a little bit more trial and error and testing things out? I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to pretend to know as much as, um, you know, someone who, who works in the, you know, in, the, in I guess, the hardware of, of property. Um, you know, that's that's definitely not my, my background. But I think, you know, Jim touched on a, on a really interesting point, culturally speaking, which is knowing knowing when it's acceptable to fail. Um, and, you know, in order to get good technology, um, you know, good technology products that kind of capture a an industry, generally speaking, are vertically aligned and horizontally integrated, you know, platform companies, which are, you know, very good at solving, um, you know, a wide range of, of problems and managing a, a process. Um, and those types of businesses, generally speaking, live on live online. Um, and, um, and those businesses benefit from being developed in a way where you are you know, where you are incredibly close to your customers. Um, and, you know, and I think that's, that's, you know, that's kind of my, my experience of, of working, uh, you know, in software, software businesses and online businesses primarily. Um, I'll, you know, an example of, uh, an example of, of, of fronted uh, that I can tell you is, you know, when we, when we started building this, this product, our assumption was that 
most people will come to us when they have found a place that they want to move to and they're just like cool i've got a place uh, i just want fronted to pay the deposit um that's kind of what we assumed would happen uh, in reality it's it's the complete opposite is that most people wanted to come to us first uh, and then and then go off and and, and find a, a property and you know it's a subtle it's a subtle difference but actually from a product perspective it kind of changes everything um but because we didn't know um in the early days we didn't really know what our what the appropriate go to market was going to be for our for our company so we just you know we we built something very very quickly to put into the market to see how people reacted and very quickly we learned that it was wrong it was incorrect um and so uh, you know internally we don't have a a culture of we got it wrong someone's at fault everyone you know everyone needs to be kind of like flogged and punished you know it's it's okay our first our first idea wasn't the right one um but now we know we have way more information about what people do want than when we did than what we did two weeks ago and bit by bit week by week deploying changes and and you know and, and making things kind of more appropriate and work better for the the kinds of customers that are coming to us you know we're engineering a product that you know run almost runs itself um you know which is the which is the goal of any technology business but it, it comes from the fact that the culture that we have internally is it's actually okay to fail um, and as long as those um, you know failures are you know something that you can learn from and don't have those big um, you know impacts that I'm sure building buildings uh, that fail uh, will obviously have um, then it's okay and then it, and it means that everyone in the team wants to jump in on all the problems because um, you know that culture is is like a safe environment for everyone to, to contribute um, whether you're a marketing person whether you're a developer um, you know or whether, whether you're someone like me who's you know, just um, excited to do lots of stuff and, uh, and, and, and do lots of cool things um, but yeah, that culture of you know it's okay to fail and and, uh, and get things wrong occasionally is is you know is part and parcel of what makes a um, a fast moving business fast moving. Um, you know, otherwise you just you get caught in your head and you're like, well, what if it goes wrong? Or what if we do this? And you end up not making that many decisions, um, which can kind of be a real negative and a, and a real hindrance to a small um, startup like us. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm conscious of time. We're coming to the end, and we've scratched the surface of a lot of different uh, topics. There's an opportunity for data and technology to have a big impact, but I think a lot more that's coming across is the cultural aspects, and, and I would argue leadership is part of that. So if I could just come to all of you for a final thought of one thing that you would really like to see happen in the property sector, or you would recommend people to do if they're, if they're listening and watching this, to go and engage with the topic. What is it that you'd most like to see happen? Uh, and Jim, maybe I could start with you on that. I think, and I think Jamie sort of alluded to it, I think think about where, where, it, where it makes sense to try and speed things up because that risk is a function of velocity. If, if you can do things fast, then it is more acceptable to fail, which means what you need to start thinking about is, well, what are the things that we do as a business that where moving fast, changing fast is going to give us, it's going to benefit us and focus on figuring out how you can improve velocity there rather than thinking about it across the board, because otherwise you're going to end up doing a lot of innovating in your general ledger, which is both boring and bad. So it's that idea of think about where you can, where you want to apply these kind of ideas to the business you're in. That's good advice. Thank you, Jim. Sam, same question to you. One thing you'd like to see or you'd recommend people to do? Um, I think it's for companies to really think about their data infrastructure um, and how they're going about capturing clean data and being able to use it across the whole value chain. Um, Resi as a sector has got the greatest opportunity to create the most number of data points versus um, commercial real estate, which you have 100 million and can have that in a single office block with a single tenant for 15 years and make interviews with res Resi, that's obviously the complete opposite end of the spectrum. So the ability to create huge amounts of data is really um, in Resi, um, but people need to actually be capturing it to then be able to use it in the future. Um, I think there was one terrifying statistic that 70% of 
companies, real estate companies data sits in Excel sheets in attachments on emails, which I thought was shocking, but not completely surprising. Um, yeah, we need to do everything we can to sort of move away from that and centralize data within companies. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. I suppose the uh, the frightening question that follows that is where's the other 30 percent? But maybe that's for another day. Uh, Gonzalo, same same point to you. Yeah, so I would I would just encourage people to to look around in, in the industry because we, we we work in an industry which is super exciting. It's it's old. It's um, business models are are not working as well as they should do. There's lots of opportunities, and I would say that's that's a humongous kind of super exciting place to be because you're looking at the kind of current ways you're doing stuff, and also new technology, new business models, new opportunities are coming in. So I would just challenge uh, challenge yourself as being someone that. I in, uh, at a consultancy, there's so many huge opportunities in this market. And for us, it's that 160,000 homes that are not being built, which is a, a blue ocean worth 32 billion every year, which is just ridiculous. So what's, what's the blue ocean in your, in your part of the sector and what can be done and, and what can you bring in house to try and explore it? Brilliant. Thanks, Gonzalo. And Jamie, finally to you. Um, a bit of an odd one, I think, um, is what I would like to see is the kind of the government's ambition and the you know, and, and things that we saw in in the in the UK from a financial perspective, vision of a much more portable data um, system to be beyond just that of financial data, but also um, other you know, institutions which hold a lot of consumer data. Um, you know, to be to be mandated to pull their act together um, and and actually be in a better position to um, give customers the ownership over that data and take it where they where they want to take it in order to you know create better outcomes for themselves. I think that's the you know it's it's one of the most powerful things that we saw in the financial um, services industry when we were building my previous company, Bud was the amount of people who just by having their financial data interpreted a different way suddenly were like i'm paying for three different gym memberships and i didn't even realize it uh you know or um you know or other other you know uh, highlighting other things like giving them better uh, better ways to save their money you know that's just one part of like customer data which was made more available to to consumers and i think there's a lot of interesting data within homes and housing um which people have never really bundled together or given access to, which I think would, you know, would encourage a really interesting swathe of, of innovation in, in the sector um, from, a, from, a, from a renter and landlord and, and a tenant perspective. Brilliant. So unfortunately, we're out of time, but, but I'm sure we can talk about this a lot more. But thank you very much to all of you for taking part. And thank you for those points. And I think, uh, as came across in the first section as well, the first panel discussion, that there is an awful lot of work to do around data as a sector. Um, there are some huge opportunities for us, but actually one of the most important things is about focusing on people, both the people that we're building for, but also the culture of organizations and um, trying things out. And I think that's come across very strongly. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, the panel's now going to be open, uh, the, the discussion room uh, for discussions with uh, other people is gonna be open for another 15 minutes till 11.45. So the platform's going to stay open. Uh, and I'd also just like to finally wrap up by saying thank you very much to all of the people on the panels who've joined us, the attendees, and most of all the sponsors, uh, Bruntwood Works, Malcolm, and Morgan Sindel Construction. Uh, and finally, just to point out, the upcoming event on the 13th of May for Place Tech is looking at retail and leisure, so have a look for that. So thank you very much. Please do stay around afterwards and uh, chat with people and talk. Uh, and thank you very much again to the panellists.